Scripture this morning is Galatians 5, 16 through chapter 6 and verse 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own word. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. I'm going to have her just share a little bit and then we'll have a word of prayer before the sermon. We lost another family member this week, and she is very struggling. She needs uplifting and love from the body. Okay, her name is Julie? Yes. Okay, very good. Let's just have a word of prayer before we do. Mr. So, Heavenly Father, as we uh, gather here today, we think about uh, a church family, and one of the things that we are to do, as we're going to talk about shortly, is that we are to bear one another's burdens. And so we pray for Joy as she now has this burden, the uh, loss of life again within her family. And as she is struggling, I just pray, Lord, that those who know her will reach out to her, will minister love, will minister concern, and will be able to provide her a biblical perspective of what she's going through. And so, again, I just pray for joy that you'll be with her and that uh, you will care for her and that she will find your comforting presence in the form of a church family who will care for her as well. Now we pray as we uh, take a look at the text in uh, Galatians chapter 6 about bearing one of those burdens. Help us to really listen to the word of God. Help me to faithfully preach the text today and talk about how we are to fulfill this obligation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Very early on in my ministry in Rush City, one Sunday morning as the service was beginning, I noticed a young family of five filled into the back row, a husband and wife and three young girls. Uh, from my perspective, they could not have looked more miserable being in church. I could tell they really didn't want to be there. They sat in the back. They kept their coats on. As soon as I said amen, they were first to meet me at the door. I could tell they were ready to get out of there. And anyway, the husband said to me, he said, uh, you need to bless my marriage and baptize my kids. And says, so, okay. Catholic background. And so I said, well, I said, uh, I'd be happy to come to your home sometime. I'd love to sit down and talk about that. And he was a very blunt guy. He says, you're not coming to my house. What would the neighbors think of pastors showing up and all that? But they kept coming back to church. We have really good children's ministry. Uh, and so uh, they had these three young girls. And so they kept coming back Sunday after Sunday, still looking miserable, still wanting to get out of there. But they continued to come. He always listened to my sermons, and so whenever I would say something in the sermon that either he didn't agree with or he didn't understand, he would kind of uh, meet me at the door and kind of question me, why would you say something like that? I says, well, uh, when you invite me to your house, we can talk about that as well. You're not coming to my house. Okay, I can wear you down. 
So anyway, uh, one Sunday, we were having a time of uh, kind of praise and prayer. And so he stood up, and he kind of bared his soul, and he said, a good friend of his had recently passed away, and he asked if I would have a word of prayer for this individual who passed away. Well, that's a dilemma for me, because I don't believe in praying for the dead, and so I thought about that. So as I went to my time of prayer, I prayed for him instead. And... uh, At the door, he got mad at me. He says, why are you praying for me? I'm not the one who died. I says, well, when you invite me to your house, we can talk about that as well. (laughs) Well, after about six months of coming to church, he finally relented and let me come to his house, and I I got to know them. Here's the background of this uh, family. He had recently gotten out of jail. He had done a stint for, he had been in St. Cloud for about three years. He'd grown up in a a home. uh, His parents had been divorced very early. He lived with his father. His father was uh, an alcoholic. He told me stories as a teenage kid. He and his dad would go up north every weekend fishing. And as they're driving up, he is mixing the drinks for his dad as his dad is driving. That was just a normal life for him. Uh, This man fathered a child at the age of 16, and so his life was just a mess. Anyway, he had been living up north, and so uh, he was thinking of a way of making money and so he started breaking and entering. Now, uh, what he would do, he had an old truck, and he'd find some cabin up north, and he would actually drive into the front door, smash it open, go in and grab what was there, and get out of there. And he had been doing a lot of that. He finally got caught. And uh, he made the mistake of smart enough to the judge, and so he got sent away for three years. He had just gotten out of prison, and then he met this woman. The wife, she had recently gotten out of a very abusive relationship herself, uh, also with her as she grew up, her mother had been killed early on in life, and so she kind of had to become the older daughter, kind of raised all of her siblings. And so uh, she had met up with a man who was very abusive to her. He had fathered the three uh, girls that were theirs, and now she was pregnant now with this man's child. And so with that toxicity on both their sides, they had found each other, and they had walked into our church. And so I realized that we, uh, we had a task to do because they had a lot of issues. I finally convinced them to do the discipleship lessons with me that I've been teaching in the uh, Sunday school class. And so it became very interesting just because of his background and because of his bluntness. In that sense, it was really fun to talk to them just because they didn't have any of that church baggage. And so they began to look at the scriptures. And uh, we had some great conversations. And so for the next 12 weeks, I was going to their home and opening up the Word of God. And through the course of discipleship lessons, they made a profession of salvation. I still remember the Sunday that uh, they gave their testimonies and they got baptized. It was one of the highlights of my time in Rush City, just because they had gotten saved out of such a life of misery and had come to Christ. And again, the husband is a really blunt guy. We read a passage in the adult class out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 where the Apostle Paul talks about, you know, you know, don't be deceived, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he has that list of all the sins, you know the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the drunkards, and all that, and they also mentioned homosexuality. Anyway, the husband reads that passage, and then in his coarse way he says, other than being gay, I did them all. And the church just broke out in laughter. And so one moment you'd be crying because of you know, his story. Anyway, so they got saved. They got baptized. They became a part of our church. But I also realized that because of all the baggage, they, there were going to be a lot of issues that we had to deal with. And again, because the three girls were not his, there was discipline issues. And then also, we, uh, they had three more kids, to, girls, and so he, all of a sudden he had six girls. And there's these issues about, you know, you're not my dad. And so we got involved in a lot, and the people of the church really pitched in. We got him into a small group. I got a group of guys together who could speak truth into his life. Um, he did have a drinking problem. And so when the stress of marriage came upon him, he resorted to drinking. And still, I still remember one night in particular, he had been drinking pretty heavy, and he got mad at his wife. He'd actually gone out into the garage, and in his anger, he'd actually nailed the door shut. And so anyway, his wife called me and told me that her husband was drinking, so I drove across town. I knocked on the door. He thought it was his wife. He says, go away, leave me alone. I said, uh, Peter, it's Pastor Dave. Oh, you could just say, uh, oh, give me a minute. I've got to find a hammer. He said, you know. And he opened the door, and again, he was intoxicated. And, and so you know, that was just our life with them. And so I would say of all the families I dealt with in my 23 years at Rush City, I probably invested more 
hundreds of hours in this couple than anyone else. And the, the church family did a great job as well. My elders did. One time I was actually gone on vacation, and uh, there was a major conflict, and he was drinking pretty heavy. And so my elders actually came along and actually took the wife and the girls out of the home and put them up in their home for a couple of nights. And, of course, he got mad about that. And so, and so we had really good moments of you know, growth and maturity, and then there would be the falling back into the old habits. And so I realized with them that if we were going to really be a church family, we had to learn to bear their burdens because they had a lot of them. And that is what I want to talk about this morning. So I would invite you to turn to the passage that uh, Scott read for us. And this is out of Galatians chapter 6. And I had him read a portion of chapter 5 as well to give a context. And so we're in Galatians. We were in Galatians last Sunday. Let me give you just a really brief um, background again of why Paul wrote this particular letter. Again, you may remember that Paul had traveled to the region of southern Galatia on his first missionary journey. He had gone to the cities of Derby and Lystra. That's where he was stoned. But what had happened is that as Paul had gone to those Jewish synagogues, he had found Gentile God-fearers who had been attracted to Judaism. He shared the gospel, and so these Gentiles had responded to the gospel, and uh, he had started churches. After Paul left there and gone back to Antioch of Syria, Jewish believers from Jerusalem who did not like Paul's message of the fact that Gentiles did not have to live under the Mosaic Law, they had followed Paul's steps, had gone to all those, and they were telling these Gentile Christians, to really complete your Christian experience, you need to live under the Mosaic Law. And they were beginning to feel that, you know what, maybe we do. That, again, think about that. That's why they had been at that synagogue in the first place. They had liked the monotheism, the worship of one God. They had also liked the morality that the Mosaic Law offered. Therefore, they're thinking, you know what, maybe we need to do that. And so Paul writes this letter. It's a letter of warning to them saying, if you go back to live under the Mosaic Law, he says, what you're doing, you're trading one form of slavery for another. Before you came to Christ, you were slaves to sin. If you go back to live under the Mosaic Law, you're living a life of slavery to legalism. Paul says, what I want you, I want you to live a life of service to God and love as well. And so today, as we move into Galatians 6, where we find a one another command, Paul is defining this new life in Christ for these Gentile believers, and he uses this expression of walking in the Spirit. And that's a unique concept. Paul will use that expression a lot in many of his letters. And so what Paul is saying is, instead of living by the letter of the law, believers are to walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. One of the aspects of walking in the Spirit is the obligation to bear one another's burdens. And Paul says, in doing that, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. So don't worry about fulfilling the law of Moses. That is no longer for you. But there's a higher calling, and that is the law of Christ. And one of the ways we can do that is to care one another. So again, let me just read again. We'll just look at Galatians 6, 1 and 2, and we'll explain some of that. So Paul says again, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. One of the authors that I read as I worked through the letter of Galatians, his name is James Dunn, and he, coined, he, he wrote this phrase. I want you to listen to it. In fact, I'll probably repeat it twice. He, he writes, fundamental to this section is the thought that the order of the Spirit is marked both by sympathy toward others and a readiness to criticize oneself, not the other way around. I know it's my nature. It is very easy for me to criticize others and to let myself kind of go free. What he recognizes within this passage, is, as Paul writes it, fundamental to walking in the Spirit is actually sympathy toward others and a readiness to criticize myself. Let's take a look at what he gets there. So the first part, if you're following the outline and taking notes, first of all, he's going to talk about getting out of step with the Spirit. How do you get out of step with the Spirit? Look at that phrase. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression. Paul uses a number of Greek nouns in his letters to describe what a transgression is. The one that he uses here, it characterizes sin as a trespass. 
stepping out of bounds. And again, that fits really well. He's been talking about walking in the Spirit. And so he's talking about stepping out of bounds, trespassing. My uh, oldest child, Elizabeth, is a wonderful mother now of 33. When uh, she grew up in the small town of Rush City, she went off to college. She went to Northwestern in St. Paul. In her freshman year, one Friday night, she and her friends were bored. There's nothing worse than a bunch of college kids who were bored. And the school is in Roseville, and so they decided just to go for a walk. And as they're walking through Roseville, uh, if you're familiar, there's Rosedale, and there's a lot of shopping. Anyway, they found an abandoned grocery store. And in their ignorance, uh, small-town kids, uh, they decided to go into that grocery store and just walk around. There's no one there. Anyway, they got out of there, and if you know around Rosedale, there's a lot of strip malls. And they found a strip mall, and there was a garbage can. Anyway, what they did, they actually got on top of the garbage can, and they all just got on top of that strip mall, and they were simply watching the night sky. They were just sitting out there talking, doing no harm. What they didn't realize, there was someone working in that store late at night, and they heard people on the roof, and they thought they were breaking and entering. And so my daughter and a bunch of her friends, there were about 10 of them there, they're just sitting up there just kind of talking all that. All of a sudden, cops shroud the strip mall. They, were, they all got ordered off, and they all got arrested, put in cop cars, and they got sent to jail. My daughter did time. And so she actually did, she did 24 hours. And again, you know, we're talking to an innocent small town kid. She got arrested, and she spent 24 hours in the Ramsey County Jail. And uh, her roommate that night in the cell was an exotic dancer. That's a fancy word for her. She was a stripper. And she had been there because uh, she stabbed her boyfriend. So you can imagine that. And so she looks at my daughter as fresh meat, you know, this innocent. And so she starts talking to my daughter about, you know, you're going to get charged with a felony. And basically by the end of the night, my daughter thought she was just going away for life. Anyway, she got out of jail. And anyway, then she had the, the unpleasant task of calling Karen and Dad. And so anyway, she called the house, and she said, uh, Mom and Dad, I need to tell you something. And so she told me the story of trespassing, and, and it, it all worked out. Uh, it was a great lesson for her. And so uh, the only punishment, by the time she called me, I knew that she would learned her lesson, so I didn't need to hammer her. All I said is, all you got to do, you got to tell your three brothers the stupid thing you did, because they all looked at their sister as she doesn't do anything wrong. It was kind of fun. And so uh, we all went out to eat one day. And so my daughter had to tell her three younger brothers that she did something really stupid. To this day now, they like to give her a hard time. You know, you're the only one who did hard time, you know. And <laughs> so we're talking about stepping out of bounds, okay? So that's what sin is. In fact, Paul would use that word. In fact, uh, another passage, he wrote in Colossians 2, verse 13. Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses, the same word, trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive, having forgiven all your trespasses. And then look at the other expression. Not only are they that, but he talks about being caught, if you're caught in any transgression. That's a great way to describe sin. Most of us don't wake up in the morning and plan to deliberately sin. Normally, we get caught up in it. The idea of thinking that expression about being caught in sin, either the idea of being overtaken by surprise or to be overcome before one escapes, or it means being caught by another Christian who sees you do it. That's another way to look at that. I had a guy that uh, I had in the church in Rush City, and uh, he was in construction. And he was a little sketchy to begin with. Anyway, one day he called me up, said, Dave, you got to come over to my house. I, did, I think I did something stupid. And uh, I wasn't surprised. He had a habit of doing things that were stupid. Anyway, I got over to his house. And he opened his garage door, and his, his garage was filled with brand new tools. Now, he was in construction and all that. What happened was is that uh, some guy wanted to sell him these tools out of the back of his truck. Right away, your radar should go off. If some guy's selling you uh, tools out of the back of his truck, most likely he didn't come by those legally. And so in the back of his mind, he's kind of thinking that, but boy, it was a really good price. <laughs> and so anyway, he buys all those tools and finally convicts him. You know what? I'm sure I bought hot tools. And so what do you do? You call Pastor Dave. And so, yeah, so anyway, uh, he, he got caught. You know, he did something foolish. And so what we did is that we called the, uh, the police chief and explained that. He turned him over, and we dealt with that. But sometimes you get caught doing something foolish. And so that's what Paul is describing. And so that is the nature of sin. 
Which begs the reason, that's why every one of us needs a church family to come alongside us, that when we do something like that, we have a resource whereby we can get right again with God. And so again, that is my argument. That is one of the reasons why every Christian needs to be a serious part of a church family, because we are all going to get caught in these trespasses. We're all going to do things that we, are, we know to be wrong. And so even though we have received a new nature at the moment of conversion, our old nature is still alive and active. And we know that from experience. I want to introduce you to a passage, and we're going to look at the screen there. This comes out of Ephesians chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul uses a great analogy for the things that we deal with. And so look at what Paul writes in, Galatians, or in Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. He says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed by the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So what Paul is saying is that in the Christian sense, there are two wardrobes that every one of us have been given. And these wardrobes we both received at birth. One we received at our physical birth, and the other we received at our spiritual rebirth. I want you to notice five interesting contrasts, and I put it up on the screen there, I try to emphasize. There is the idea of putting off and putting on, okay? And so the old wardrobe, you've got to put it off. The new wardrobe, you've got to put on. Toward the end of the sermon, I'm going to tell you a story. On Friday, um, I, I've got a friend uh, who lives up in Pine City. He manages a bunch of senior apartments, Anyway, he called me up about a month ago saying, hey, Dave, i got to do a clean-out. There's an older gentleman who lived in an apartment down in Wyoming for 22 years. He had passed away. He said, we got to clean out his basement. I need help. So I was a nice grunt on Friday. Well, by the time I got done cleaning out that garage, my clothes were filthy. You know the first thing I did when I got home? I put them off, and I took a shower. And so Paul used that analogy. So there's a certain wardrobe. you got to put it off. The new wardrobe you've got to put on. Notice the second contrast. There is the old self, and there's the new self. For those of you who have a different translation, it's not unusual to talk, remember, the old man and the new man? And the reason why we have that analogy, that actually is the Greek word that Paul uses. He uses the word anthropos. And so he said, you've got an old man, now you've got the new man. And which one are you going to listen to? The third contrast is between a corrupted old nature and then a created new nature. And so you and I were born with an old nature that by its very nature was corrupt. No one ever had to tell me how to disobey. I came by it naturally. What is the first word that most kids learn? No, that's right. You didn't have to tell any kid that. Why? Because we are born with a corrupted nature. And so the contrast is we are at conversion we are created. We get this new nature. Notice the fourth contrast. The old nature is characterized by deceitful desires. They're deceitful in the sense that if I do them, I do them because I think they're going to make me happy. They're deceitful because they never do. That's why they're called deceitful. And the contrast is true righteousness and holiness. And notice the last contrast. The former manner of life versus this new attitude. And so Paul is telling us that from the moment of our physical birth, we have had a wardrobe that is old and decaying. From the moment of our spiritual rebirth, we are given a new wardrobe that is pure and perfect. The decision each believer needs to make concerns which wardrobe he or she will put on each day. See, becoming a believer is immediate, but becoming mature is a lifetime. One of the lessons I have in this discipleship series I'm doing with you is a lesson on sanctification. Sanctification is the day-to-day process of putting off the old and putting on the new. Going back to this couple that I pastored, there were times that they lived in their new nature and they made great spiritual choices. Other times they fell back into the old nature and they went back to the old habits. And that was all the difference in their lives. And so we all go through that as well. And so that is why Paul talks about the works of the flesh. And that's, the, that's one of the reasons why I had Uh, Scott read even a portion of chapter 5 and that is that there are the works of the flesh the things that come to you and I naturally 
And so the point is that even though Satan has lost possession of our souls, he still wants to ruin our lives and ruin our witness. I want you to listen to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and think about the man who wrote those things and what his life had been like before. So Peter writes, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith. Now, the man who wrote those letters, wrote these words, he knew what he was talking about. Remember before Jesus' crucifixion? Jesus told Simon, Satan has desired you that he may sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Peter knew exactly what could happen. Even though Peter was a believer, he fell back into the old ways, and when tight life was tough, he denied the Lord. Of course, he had to be restored. Also, we know even from the letter of Galatians, remember, even in Galatians, the Apostle Paul had to kind of brace Peter. Remember that Peter had gone to those towns and he had actually stopped fellowship with Gentiles? And so Peter had to be confronted as well. So it is very easy to get out of step. So the second half of the sermon, let's talk about how do you get back in step? And here's where you and I come in. So Paul goes on to write, how do you get back in step with the Spirit? The solution to sin in a believer's life is to have brothers and sisters in Christ in his or her life. But these believers, to be helpful, have to have a number of qualities in order to do that. And so first of all, Paul says, you who are spiritual. Now in today's culture, being spiritual doesn't mean anything anymore. About two years ago, when I was pastoring in Rush City, I had a couple stop at the church, and they wanted some money. It's very common, and that's one of the things I like about pastoring out here in Hillman, here out in the country. No one's stopping and asking for money. In Rush City, I, I got asked for money all the time. So anyway, this couple comes in, and so they, they ask me, they'd like to have some gas money. So I begin to hear the story and all that, and what they have is, you know, they're living kind of month to month. Anyway, they had gotten a cat, a kitty, okay? They got the kitty free, but uh, they wanted to get the kitty fixed. And so they wanted me to give them gas money to drive to the cities where they could get the cat free or get, get the cat fixed for free. I said, you know, if I can't afford a pet, I don't get a pet. And uh, so anyway, I wasn't really inclined to help them, but I did, you know, I, I did take the time. And so I began to talk to them about spiritual things. And so uh, I talked to them and uh, oh, the young lady says, oh, oh, oh I'm spiritual. I said, I don't even know what that means anymore. What do you mean you're spiritual? In her mind, she didn't have to go to church. She didn't believe in objective truth. I had actually offered to do the discipleship class. No, I don't need that and all that. She says, I'm spiritual. Well, this is kind of that, that fuzzy, you can't even get your hands on it. I don't even know what that means. What does it mean for the Apostle Paul? Well, Paul says, you who are spiritual. A person who is spiritual is someone who is walking in step with the Spirit. How can you tell they're walking in step with the Spirit? They demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. And so Paul says, if you're going to get involved in the life of a believer who's been caught in a sin, the first qualification you need is you need to be spiritual. That means you yourself needs to be walking in the Spirit. But then notice what else he goes on to say. So you who are spiritual, what do you need to do? You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Okay? What that means is spiritual believers need to have their minds saturated with the word of God that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. See, if their minds are saturated by the word of God, they will give counsel that is biblically based and not simply their opinion. And that's one of the challenges that many times we have a lot of ideas. The question is, are my ideas, do they come from Scripture? Or are they just my ideas? To me, if I'm going to get involved in someone's life, they're dealing with sin, I need to know I'm coming from a biblical perspective so when I'm telling them, I can actually back it up with Scripture. I love this phrase that Paul wrote in the book of Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to the hearts of God. I thought about that. When I went over to this couple's house with all the mess of their lives, I wanted to make sure that what I was giving them was biblical, backed up with Scripture, because that's the only thing that was going to change them. 
Another quality for a confronter is a combination of honesty and humility. Because Paul says, keep watch to yourself. What does that mean? It is very easy for me to find the fault in your life and ignore the fault in my life. Being a pastor, that's kind of been my mode. My, being a pastor for 32 years, as I minister to people, is that I look at the flaws in their lives. What Paul was saying, you better make sure you look at your flaws too. Don't be telling your people something that you're not doing yourself. In fact, this is a very common passage. Look at that passage that Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Dear? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourselves do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take out the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. So if I'm going to get involved in another person's life who's struggling with sin, I need to make sure that I have honestly dealt with my own sin before I get involved in theirs. And so what that means is that being a part of a Christian community demands that we are involved in each other's lives. We are required to receive and to give assistance to one another. The son in the congregation has a burden caused by sin that is too heavy to bear. His Christian family is expected to help him carry that load and to make his burden lighter to bear. That's why it requires you to be a part of a local church. So I want to draw three realities in my conclusion. I'm going to tell you a story. One, all Christians have burdens caused by sin. Every one of us. We still have our own nature. Every one of us periodically have burdens caused by sin. Number two, none of us are self-sufficient on our own to deal with our sin nature. And so the question is, do you let others into your life and do you accept their help? I have found as a pastor, people let me know whether I was invited into their life or not. I could feel it. I could tell whether I was invited into the lives of their children or if they didn't want me to talk into their kids. So you can do that as well. You need to send out a message that you are letting your church family know you are welcome to come into my life and confront me when I need it. And because all Christians have burdens caused by sin and none of us are self-sufficient, God intends for us to carry each other's burdens. So the question I have is, whose life are you involved with right now? And who have you invited into your life? On Friday, I had spent the day, again, my friend had called me up and asked me to help clean out that basement garage. For 22 years, that guy had packed stuff away, so... We walked in, and it looked pretty overwhelming. We had a 30-yard dumpster, and four of us, we filled it top to bottom, front to back, with the junk that this man had accumulated in his life. It was in the basement. It was dirty. Most of the stuff I picked up was like, you know, it had a kind of a, a stickiness to it or whatever, or molding and all that. So after two hours of really dirty work, we loaded that guy's dumpster up. So anyway, my friend was very generous, and again, it was a messy job. And so anyway, I was paid very nicely uh, for my two hours worth of work, far more than I make as a pastor. So anyway, uh, I made the mistake of telling Karen how much money I'd made for those two hours. And so she texted back to me, I think you need to take me out to eat tonight. <laughs> <coughs> okay, we hadn't gone out for a while. So we were thinking, you know, where do you want to go to eat? So we kind of, she was at school, so we were texting back and forth. And so we're thinking, okay, what restaurant are we going to go out to eat tonight? Before she left school, one of her best friends, uh, she and her husband are members of, my, of the church in Rust City. They are some of our best friends. He, a week ago, was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so he will be having his prostate removed in August. And again, uh, he called me over. And so I knew it's been a burden to him. And so anyway, as Karen was leaving school, he talked to this man's wife who works in the office. And uh, she let us know that uh, her husband was... He's, he wasn't doing very well that day. And so when Karen came home, she says, I think that we need to do something with them instead. Okay. Well, if you haven't heard it, I don't want to brag. Apparently, I make really good homemade pizza. I make my own crust from scratch. I make my own uh, sauce, or sauce and all that. So anyway, this guy loves my pizzas. In fact, uh, when I was going to resign and retire from pastor, he wanted me to just open up a pizza place and then just feed him. And so anyway, um, so I got thinking, okay, 
uh, yeah, I, I could tell that he needed us to come over. And so I called him. He's a farmer. He's right in the middle of planting, so I understand that. So I called him up, and I said, hey, I was just wondering, you know, I'm making pizza tonight. I was just wondering, uh, would you like some pizza tonight? Oh, he says, I was planning on working late tonight. So I understand. I respect farmers and all that. I says, let's try to do it another time. Well, not so quick, he said. Um, he said, oh, how late would you be willing to bring the pizza over? I have to always bring it over to his house as well. And so anyway, he said, listen, I'll get out of the field by 7. He says, yeah, he says, I think, he said he needed my pizza. I think he actually needed me. And so anyway, he said, could you be there by 7? So yeah. So we went over there. I made him his two favorite pizzas. He ate more than he should. And then we just sat until about 10 o'clock and just talked. And I could tell by the time we got done, he was feeling better. And so I thought about that, and that when you carry someone of those burdens, you have the plans, okay, let's go out to eat and treat ourselves. By the end of the evening, it was actually more enjoyable to minister to them. Because he needed that. He needed me in his life. And so, to me, that is what a church family should do. We all have burdens. We all struggle with sin. What do we need? We need other believers in our lives who are spiritual. That is, they are walking the step of the Spirit. They're dealing with their own issues. Their minds are saturated with the Word of God. And when they're going to confront you, they're going to do it because they want to restore you. They actually want to care about you. And so that is the responsibility we have. Let's close the Lord of Prayer, and then we'll have one final song. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for the nature of the local church. That we are to be members one of another. That means we are to care for each other. The reality is that every one of us struggles with sin issues in our lives because we still have our old nature. Therefore, we need to invite other believers into our lives who, if they are in step with the Spirit, who they are dealing with their own sin issues and their minds are saturated with the Word of God, they're going to come into our lives and with love and gentleness, they are going to encourage us to deal with the sins that we are struggling with. Every one of us needs that. And so I pray that we will welcome people into our lives to provide that ministry. I pray your blessing on this final song. And then bless the church family as they gather for a meal and also for the business meeting to follow. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.